Welcome to this presentation of Ask UAS via Facebook Live. Ask UAS, where Ketchikan finds answers. Ask UAS is a lecture series hosted by the UAS Ketchikan Campus Library, and past presentations are available on the University of Alaska Southeast Ketchikan Campus's YouTube page. Today we are very proud to present Home Movies, Preserving Family and Community History, and our first panelist today will be Pat Tully, who is the director of the Ketchikan Public Library and will discuss her experience reformatting and making accessible 60 years of family movies. Hi everyone, my name is Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library. Thanks so much for tuning in to this Ask UAS presentation on home movies and their importance in preserving family and community history. The aim of this presentation is to inspire you to preserve your own family's recordings and also to keep making home movies to record the history that we're living through right now. So I have a presentation that I'm going to be showing you. I'll begin by briefly describing a project that I've undertaken with a lot of help to reformat and preserve my own family's home movies. After that, I'll introduce Terry Richardson, who you may recognize as the creator of many of the amazing ship and airplane models um, at the Tongass Historical Museum. Terry's also interested in reformatting old movies to formats that are easily accessible today. And he'll talk about the equipment that he uses to do that reformatting. Then Alex Vrabeck, who is the social media, PR, and video production manager at KPU Telecommunications, will give us some tips and advice on creating new family videos. And finally, Erica Jane Christian, who is the program coordinator at Ketchikan Museums, will show how to record meaningful conversations with family members and how to elevate your home recordings of family events so that they're useful and valuable records for future generations. So that's the plan for this presentation. And so uh, I'm going to go to our next slide by starting to describe our My Family Movie Project. So my mom received her first movie camera in 1954 when she was 15. Uh, she's holding it in this picture here. And for the next 50 years, mom and her younger brother, our Uncle Mike, who's also shown in this picture, recorded a variety of family events and vacations. As we grew older, we hated it when mom pulled out the camera and started filming. There are so many shots of us when we were teenagers and young adults, putting our hands in front of our faces. No, no, don't do it. Um, we joked that nobody would know what we looked like in 100 years. So as the years went by, mom moved from using a film camera to using a camcorder, first using VHS tapes, then two different sizes of 8mm uh, tape cartridges, and finally a camcorder using an SD card. So of course, now many of our devices don't use any, don't use any physical medium at all. Recordings are saved to the cloud. Now in the meantime, mom's old film projector stopped working. So the films just sat in a box in my mother's closet. Now in the early 1990s, mom pulled those films out of the closet and converted them to a VHS tape. Uh, and the company she sent it to added an especially cheesy music soundtrack um, since there was no sound in these old uh, 1950s movies. But after a dozen or so more years went by, fewer and fewer of us had VCRs to play the VHS version. So it too languished on the shelf with other old VHS tapes. So when mom passed away in the spring of 2019, we found hundreds of recordings in various formats going all the way back to 1954. It had been ages since any of us had seen them and we didn't have the machines to play them on. So I ended up shipping a few boxes of the recordings to myself here in Alaska. So going to the next slide, please. So then I was left with the question, how to convert these recordings? 
My first idea was to send them off to a service like Legacy Box or some other format conversion company. There are several out there. But when I called them for more information, all the national companies indicated that they didn't serve Alaska. One actually said that they only serve the United States. And when I mentioned that Alaska is one of the United States, they corrected themselves and said that they only serve the contiguous United States. So it, now this might be completely different now. This was about a year ago when I was making these phone calls. So I was stuck. Then somebody, and it might have been somebody at the museum, mentioned that I should speak to Terry Richardson that in addition to the wonderful models he creates, um, he's also interested in film preservation. So I contacted Terry, and he and his wife Elizabeth did a fantastic job of converting all the recordings I had um, from mom into a DVD format. From there, I was able to upload them to YouTube so I could share the links with the rest of the family. We've got the next slide. So YouTube has several uploading options. You can upload a recording so that it's public and anybody can go and search for it using the title, the keywords, and the summary that you put in when you upload it and find it and view the recording. But you don't have to make the recording available publicly. You can instead upload it as unlisted, which means that you can't do a search for it, but you need a link to see it on YouTube. Or you can upload it as private, which means that you can only view it if you're specifically given permission to do so by the person who uploaded the recording. Now in my case, I chose to upload my family's recordings as unlisted. There were so many family members in these recordings, and I wanted to respect their wishes and those of their descendants just in case they didn't want the recordings available publicly. So YouTube is a great platform for storing and playing movies, but I also wanted to organize and present the recordings in a way that's friendly to family members, some of whom aren't entirely comfortable online. So I'm ready for the next slide. So I made a very simple website um, with a password to restrict access to that site. Between Mom and Uncle Mike, I had recordings from every decade, from the 1950s through the 2010s. So that's the way I organized them. Each date here is a link to a page that then links to recordings from that decade. So the next, uh, okay. So providing context. The films from the 1950s were wonderful to see but there were some people in scenes that we in our generation, and certainly the generations after us, just didn't recognize. Because there was no sound in these early films, we decided to record our Uncle Mike commenting on the films as we viewed them together. Uncle Mike took this very seriously. He, he reviewed the films beforehand and took notes, which he then referred to while we watched the film and recorded his commentary. It was amazing what he remembered, and it added so much to our understanding of, of the family's life at that time. So this is just a very brief clip of this, a sample of this. Here we are, another card game. A couple beers. Grandpa looks like he just got up. <laughs> There's uh, Uncle Hank, a guy named Johnny Del Sinos, who's right here on Hobo Joe's down on Queen City Avenue. Uh -huh. So for later recordings with sound, you may want to add captions or screens with the date, the event, and the principal people involved. The additional information will help you and your descendants connect with the action and how it fits in with your family's story. So we're going to go to the next one. So preserving those recordings. Um, we're not a family that throws anything out. So we kept the film and the tapes in all the various formats, even when we didn't have anything to play them on. And this, as it turns out, is a good thing. After the Richardsons had converted Mom's film to DVD, I found among Mom's VHS tapes a tape of the films that she had converted back in the early 1990s. 
And I noticed in comparing the VHS conversion in the 1990s with the DVD conversion of 2019, that in the succeeding 30 years, bits of the film had deteriorated or were gone altogether. So using that VHS, that 30-year-old VHS conversion, I was able to splice in the bits that were missing from 2019. It was usually only a few seconds, but some of those seconds were priceless. So keeping and preserving the original recordings gives you and your descendants the opportunity to convert them again with better equipment that can improve the quality of those converted files. So next. So preserving history. So it is obvious that home movies preserve family history. Seeing and sometimes hearing relatives who have passed away a long time ago evoke such strong memories. The way they talked, their mannerisms, etc. It can also demonstrate traditions and traits that continue to be a part of your family now. And these recordings also provide a slice of cultural history. The fashion, settings, and activities all paint a picture of a point in time. For example, this is a wedding shower from the mid-1950s uh, with typical gifts of the period to furnish a new home. And here is my second cousin Susie as a toddler imitating Elvis Presley. And finally, these recordings depict local history. This is Blessed Sacrament Church and School in Cincinnati, Ohio, where my mom and Uncle Mike went to school. It was torn down decades ago. So the film is a record of a local landmark which no longer stands. And you may recognize this scene. My mother went on an Alaskan cruise in 1995, and the last stop was Ketchikan. This shows Parnassus Books in its former location, I think, where Soho Coho is now. So that's been uh, my experience converting uh, my own uh, family uh, movies. I recently ran across this quote from Thomas Hardy um, that I added to um, the website. It really captures the reason I undertook this project. I am the family face. Flesh perishes, I live on, projecting trait and trace through time to times and on, and leaping from place to place over oblivion. So that's the end of my part of this. Uh, now I will introduce Terry Richardson, and he is going to demonstrate how he converts recordings in old formats to new ones. Thank you, Pat. Terry Richardson. I'm interested in uh, preserving anything old, old catch can, old films, old uh, slides, and whatnot. And about 10 years ago, I uh, uh, got slides and film from a guy who is no longer with us. And a lot of his stuff was very, very um, important in my mind to the history of this area. So I did not have this machine which um, puts uh, this 8 millimeter and Super 8 onto a chip to uh, put in your computer and whatnot. So I had to do it the old fashioned way was to use my projector and project it on the wall and film it off of it with another camera that I could put it on my DVDs. Um, then after I finished that, I took the slides out to a local establishment and it cost me about $600 to have the slides uh, put on DVD. I said, well, there's got to be a better way for this. So one day I ran across a catalog that had this machine in it. And this machine was expensive, but it copies very well, does a very nice job, and it is still available on the internet. There's different ones out there. It, for those of you who have run projectors before, um, it's basically backwards. It, it feeds off here, through here, and then take-up reel is over here, whereas a projector would be the opposite way. 
Um, but it works great. Uh, you turn it on, set everything up, and, and just press the start button, and it stays um, running until it's done. And a small reel, it does small reels like these two and a half inch, it does a five inch and a seven inch, which is this big. And this reel takes about 35 minutes to do. Uh, five inch takes about three hours, and a seven inch takes around six hours, depending on the amount of film. But it'll just sit there and run on itself and it runs it through one frame at a time and copies one frame every two seconds. So you get, you get a really good picture. There, there is a better machine that will actually clean up all of this because we all know how old our film is, but I like the old film, so I like this machine. Um, it converts on this chip, the, the SD chip, it converts to MP4s and my wife, who is a computer person in my house, takes a chip and uh, on a, um, I, have a, I have a couple cards here that I've got to remember what I'm reading here. Uh, it's called Win, W-I-N-X, DVD Author. And you can download it for free. And that will convert it over to the DVDs, which is nice. Um, so we did, as Pat said, we did all of hers, and I've done stuff for other people quite a bit. Uh, the, uh, the slides now that I did for him, and I do now, are done on this machine over here. Now this machine, uh, you can stack slides in here, run them through. It will also, if I better read this to make sure that you get it right, it will also convert um, color negatives, black and white negatives, 110 color negatives, and 126 color negatives. Uh, this is an older machine that I bought after this one, but the newer machines have a bigger window to look into. It's a lot easier to, uh, to see, but I like this machine. It also uses a chip that, uh, that she takes and converts and I've got another card here, uh, slides and negatives to make a slideshow, and she makes that with a window DVD maker on her computer, and it puts it there. I'm not a computer person. Uh, she showed me, but that's much easier to let her do it. <laughs> you know how that is. Um, there are also, uh, for this high 8 as they called it, and the reason they call it high 8 is, let me get this open here, is that it has the film like a VHS in there, the same type, but it's only eight millimeters across. And there are a lot of those out there, and I've converted some of those. Um, these are the different pieces that come with this one for negatives and all of the other ones that I talked about. And I just recently purchased a flatbed scanner that will scan pictures when you don't have any negatives of the pictures, which I, don't, I have some of my dad's and some of mine that I don't have any. And I was eight, it hasn't arrived yet, but they say it will convert or copy one in eight seconds. And the machine I have now takes two and a half, three minutes. So that's going to, you know, if you have a lot, it's going to be nicer. So um, I think that'll help a lot for, for getting. Uh, I also have at home a VHS machine and two DVD machines that I can copy and change things. The other thing that I've ran into that I finally figured out was that I people have asked me to copy uh, old um, negatives that are two and a quarter inch by two and a quarter inch. Well, that won't fit in anything that I have here, but I have a light box and I take the the slide and put it on the light box and then take a picture of it and my wife again, bless her heart, I'm on a computer, can shrink down the outside edges because of the 4x6 in the camera to come up with the right size and everything else and we can copy that. And on the black and white negatives, the on anybody that's looked at them, you can see that the black part is lighter and the, and the, and the light part is darker. So she takes and converts um, that uh, for me, and that helps people that have uh, been afraid to send out any of their 
negatives for fear they get lost or that there's nobody that will do them. And as Pat said, you know, nobody wants to really do anything. Um, there is an, a flatbed scanner that we were looking at, and it's, it's expensive, uh, 230 bucks, but it will do everything this will do here, uh, this piece here with all of the different negatives and slides and whatnot, and plus it'll do the bigger format stuff. So if you wanted to buy one piece of equipment, that would be a good piece to have. Um, the, the benefit of all of this, though, for me, is to be able to see old catch can and old stuff. And if you look in, like in, in the pictures and on the film, you see so much in the background that you say, oh, I remember that. And one of the, the um, sets of the big slides I did for people was is in a business and they people go down and they go, oh, I remember that person or, oh, that's so-and-so. And, and you know, it gets people talking and memories and whatnot. And I hopefully will be able to get a little better over time with this because there's always an improvement coming out on the machines and whatnot. And, and, it's, and it's a learning experience, but I'm really happy doing this. So... I should point out one more thing for people just in case they want to buy this machine. Um, one of the problems with this machine is that this is loose in here and it feeds loose. Well, it gets a little bit of a shutter. And so uh, we got on the internet, looked and found out that there was a guy that figured out the problem. And what he did to do that was take this piece here and set it in there. And that tightens that up a little bit so that it, you don't get the shutter as it pulls it through. And so if you buy one, get yourself one of these and stick it in there. It also has a cord that plugs into a TV because you can see how small the, the little window is to look at and then you can adjust everything so you're, you're in perfect shape. But anyway, for me, I don't, that's about all I have that's uh, available for this. And thank you very much. So now we have um, Alex Brabeck of KPE Telecommunications, and she is going to give us some tips and advice for uh, creating our own family videos. So take it away, Alex. Thank you. Okay. So okay, okay. Take my mask off. Looks like you're nice and clear here. Um, so I like to call this. Home Movies, Tips on How to Create Quality Videos with Your Phone, AKA smart Smartphone Videography 101. Most of us have this amazing little gadget right here. I mean, and when I say little, I mean quite expensive, but very handy. Most of us have some sort of smartphone, whether that be an iPhone or an Android or something of that matter. Um, so it's really convenient to have this in your pocket, have this in your purse or backpack, and not be worrying about carrying around this giant camcorder. I don't know how my grandparents did it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is so much easier. So I figured I would give you all tips and tricks on how to properly record on your phone. Um, kind of just videography tips and things that we do in the industry every day. Um, as well as some editing options, because I do think that it's important that we're utilizing what we're creating in a way that not only we might be able to preserve it either on a DVD or some other sort of format, but also being able to share with our friends and family on social media or, I mean, I have a, I was supposed to have a, you know, a big family reunion this year and the idea was to have, bring something to that to share with my family um, of what we had been up to that year. So to start off, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that when you want to film like this, don't do it. It is a nightmare creator, I promise you. Granted, I'll tell you what I do. A lot of, a lot of the times I'm already on platforms like Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram stories. I'm there with you, trust me, I'm doing the same things. I'm holding my phone like this and I'm taking the video in a quick little clip creator sort of motion. When you're trying to create more of, a, more of a video style, something that can again be turned into a home video, you're gonna wanna flip your phone to this. So just do it, I know it's an extra step, but if you're gonna film for social media, go ahead, get out of that app and pull up your camera on your phone and film 
this way, okay? So this is portrait orientation, and this is landscape orientation. When in doubt, landscape orientation. Um, also, one really cool little thing about our smartphones these days is that you can actually record, you can record at um, really whatever level you would like to. So, for example, you can go in and you can change your size that you're recording at. So that's from 720 to 1080, all the way up to 4K. Um, and having that ability to choose is really nice because you have the option to what I like to call future proofing. So if you're recording in 4K, those are going to be quite large files, so make sure that your phone can handle storing, processing, um, quite a large file type. Um, otherwise, go ahead and select 1080. Um, this is actually the normal setting that's already on your phone, but like I said, most phones you do have the option to choose. So if you have that space on your phone and you want to make sure that your grandchildren are going to be able to watch this and enjoy it, why not go ahead and throw it in 4K? I mean, Ultra HD, heck yeah, let's do it. So another thing that you want to keep an eye on as well is your frames per second. So your frame rate, this is what we also call, um, usually you can choose between 24 frames per second, 30 frames per, text per second, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second. And all of these things um, really, okay, it depends on how in-depth you want to go with your home video. I mean, are you filming your son as he does a flip trick um, at the skate park? Great. Why not get that at, at 120 frames per second? I'm going to tell you why. It's going to look beautiful when you slow it down. I mean, it's going to create something that is super professional looking, which lo and behold, guess what? You just filmed it on your phone and nobody would even know. So again, take a look at your phone settings in your camera. So you go to your settings option on your phone, click your camera, and you can choose, again, that size. So 1080, 4K, 720 would be on the lower end, or that frames per second, 30, 60, 120. When in doubt, 30 frames per second is just fine. I, that's what you know we normally like to use in day-to-day -day filming anyways. Um, so the next thing that's super duper important that you might not think about when you are out there recording your videos is lighting. I cannot tell you how important it is to make sure that the lighting is where it needs to be and how it needs to be. So here's a couple little tips that I like to always keep in mind when I'm out filming. So natural versus synthetic. So that's the difference between this beautiful light right here that's coming in versus the light that's right here shining down. Um, these are two very different colors. And so when you're out and about and you're getting those and you're kind of mixing them, it's gonna create a weird sort of yellowy kind of tone because your camera doesn't quite know how to comprehend those mixes of colors. So if I can, I will almost always choose natural light. I wanna make sure that I've got a, this nice bright light that's coming in at the right direction to make sure that my subject looks fantastic. You can work with this. You can totally work with this fluorescent light. Again, not my favorite, but you know, you, you, you wanna capture every moment and that's regardless of if you have beautiful light or not. So just keep in mind that, okay, if I have this white light shining in and this yellow light coming from, you know, down above me, maybe I should shift away from that window a little bit so that my camera can comprehend this color that's coming down on me right now. Another thing that's important is where is that light source coming from? You want to make sure, again, that your subject is properly lit. So placing them where the sun is shining on is a great way to make sure that you're capturing a really beautiful moment. When you're what we like to call backlit, this is a big no-no. Um, basically what that does is when you have that light source coming in from behind you, it puts a shadow on that subject matter. And you can't actually, your camera is not going to be able to interpret that image that's all backlit. It's going to look like a shadow person dancing in front of the sun. And if that's what you're going for, awesome, do it. I love experimenting with different techniques. But if that's not what you're going for, remember, have that light coming in on your subject, not from behind. Um, another thing, I guess that, I think that's basically everything I have on lighting. But that it, I would have to say, when it comes to really great videos and not so great videos, it really, lighting is a lot of the times what makes the difference. Another really important thing to think about when you're filming is sound. I can't tell you how much it drives me nuts when I'm hearing a million different things and I can't hear what the person is saying because there's weird 
sounds happening all around. And so really when you're filming, and of course this is subject to what's going on at the time and where you're at, really do try to avoid those extra ambient loud noises. Um, and I'm like one of those people where if I'm with my family and like there's a float plane that just kind of, that sound came in, but I don't actually see the float plane. I'm like, wait, hold on, let's do that again. I'm terrible, but that's okay. If you wanna create a good quality video for the future, make sure that you keep that sound in, um, in your mind. Um, also, just throwing it out there, I know that not everybody has the ability, but there are mic options for phones. There are phones that you can purchase for 20 bucks and it actually hooks right into your phone and you have a little microphone that's attached to your phone and you can pick up that noise and it works flawlessly with it. Another thing to think about when you're, and this is more in the editing phases, but also has to do with sound is your music choice. I know some people really like to experiment and have a lot of fun with throwing music with their home videos. If you wanna be able to share it on social media, avoid copyrighted music. So head to those royalty-free music music sites and utilize those as an option for your home video because you'll be able to share and everybody will enjoy. And you're creating really an experience versus just a movie. So one thing I love about watching my grandpa's home videos, you know, from the 90s, was that he was always asking us kids what we were doing. That's one thing you don't think about. It's, it's sometimes, you know, utilize almost Utilize yourself as almost the interviewer. If you're behind the camera and you've got, you've got your, you know, your young daughter about to dig into some homemade pizza, tell her, have, ask her what she's doing. Um, kids actually, most people will respond really well to those types of questions. So if I'm behind the camera and I'm like, hey, what, what are you doing right now? They're gonna groan and be like, oh yeah, I'm eating my pizza, mom but it adds to the moment. I mean, you really wanna create this authentic video and if my grandpa could do it in 1992, I promise you can do it now in 2020. Um, so again, other ideas, have them ask them what, what they're doing or where are we? That's a great question too, because then, you know, as you're walking up onto Creek Street, you actually have that audio that's associated with it saying, we're walking into Creek Street, and we're about to go do this, this, and this. Um, really just, again, creating those really authentic moments. So editing options. That's one advantage that we have now versus back in 1992, um, that we have really easily accessible editing platforms, not only for our phone, but if you want to take it even further to the next level um, for your desktop computer. So for the phone, a couple ones that I really like, iMovie works great on any Apple device. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with a lot of the Android apps, but um, one paid one that actually works for either Android or um, iPhone is KineMaster. So K-I-N-E-M-A-S-T-E-R. And this is actually a subscription service. So it's about $3.99 a month. You could always just purchase it for when you're wanting to create your, your piece um, and then cancel the subscription later. So ultimately you're, ultimately you're paying $4 to use a really quality editing tool. So when you get into editing, you really have to think about, you know, placement of your, if you want to go in that sort of linear time frame, that's a great way to go ahead and drop your, and drag your pieces or your clips into one timeline based on when they were filmed. Super easy way to do it. If you want to get creative, go for it. I don't know, I personally don't have any ideas of what you might want to do with that, but again, this is your movie. Make it the way you want to make it. Another thing to think about with, um, with editing is not only placement of clips, but also making sure that the sound is kind of at that same level. I cannot tell you how much it drives me crazy when you have a clip that's like insanely loud and then it gets really, really quiet and then you have to like adjust the volume on your, you know, on your device or on your TV or whatever. Um, I like to fix that in editing. So, it's pretty easy, most apps or um, platforms, you can adjust the volume of each clip, and that's a really great way to just make sure that it sounds flawless throughout the entire piece. Another option that you have now that grandpa might not have had, um, you can totally voice over. So why not utilize this feature if, if you can? And it's a quick and easy way to add another really professional level to your, to your movie. So a couple of things that I like to do, um, one, 
there is like voice over voice memos in your phone. So you can actually take your, you know, iPhone headphones, plug them right into your phone. And here's the tip right here. Go somewhere quite quiet, lock yourself in the closet, lock yourself in your car, <laughs> wherever you can avoid any type of ambient, you know, mute, any sort of ambient sound that might take away from your voiceover. And another little tip, throw a blanket over your head. I know it sounds crazy, but really that is going to just make sure that the sound is nice and crisp and clean and it's only, and the microphone is only picking up your voice and not, you know, Fido in the background barking at the cat. So those are just a couple small tips on how to really make that voiceover an added extra little thing to your video. Um, so that's basically all that I have as far as recording on your phone, getting out there, tips and tricks. Um, again, utilize this, this resource you have right here. It is truly a game changer. I have seen so many amazing videos, videos that actually made it into the film festival filmed by high schoolers um, that was not only filmed on a phone, but also edited. So you would be surprised the amount that this little device here can do. Thank you. Oh, so thank you so much, Alex. And last but definitely not least, we have Erica Jane Christian, who is the program coordinator at Ketchikan Museums, and she's going to be discussing how to record meaningful conversations um, with family members and how to elevate your home recordings of events um, so that they're useful and valuable records for future generations. So take it away, Erica. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what we wanted to focus in on, um, since Pat's done an excellent job of talking about her own uh, home videos, uh, her own family home videos, and uh, Terry's kind of talked a little bit about how they worked to take those, you know, recordings and VHSs and make them uh, digitized and online and accessible for her family. Um, and Alex has done a really great job in uh, talking about some of those tips and ways that we can do better when we're filming our, uh, our, her, our family recordings, um, whether it's home videos, uh, you know, kind of elevating that. Uh, we wanted to, and, and Ketchikan Museums, wanted to talk a little bit more about how those meaningful conversations, those family recordings, uh, can actually be a very valuable resource for the future and how it can really um, help down the line future generations within your own family to better understand um, your experiences and histories and family traditions now. Um, so one of those uh, things that oral traditions and family movies are, are a really fragile link to the past, um, to that family history. Uh, one of those great regrets that many, many people have, um, you know, especially as I've been uh, working more with oral histories in our community um, and just across the field and in general, um, people regret not taking better attention, uh, not paying attention to their parents and their grandparents and their family members when they told them stories when they were children. Um, and so this is really a way to take those conversations and have meaningful conversations um, where we're actually kind of filling that gap and filling that need. Um, so you know, if you ever remember you know, summers of sitting at someone's knee and listening to them talk with other adults or just to talk to you uh, and tell you stories. Um, this is kind of taking that to another level, uh, making certain that you're making a really active, um, an active really progress of, of recording those histories. Um, and really, it's, it's easier now more than ever. Um, technology is at a point with our camera phones and things that we have. Uh, we're taking those recordings, asking those questions, filming those videos. It is really more accessible now than it's ever been for us. Um, so recording those family histories and those conversations uh, are important, and they're easy to do now. Um, so taking and preserving those stories and history as people have experienced it through those conversations is really kind of what I wanted to talk to you all about. Um, whenever you're talking or you're, you know, looking to say, you know, if it's a, a soccer game or your kid's game, uh, 
basketball and you happen to be filming that. I know that's a really common thing is, you know, filming events and birthdays and sporting events. Um, take those times when you have that camera out to ask questions. Um, not just filming the event, ask your kids how they're feeling about where they're at in their sporting games, that sort of thing. Um, those are all ways that you can really kind of enrich the video that you are taking of, of having conversations along with filming action. So that's kind of what we're talking about is uh, meaningful conversations alongside of family vacations that you're videoing, you know, beautiful landscapes, but ask the people who are there what they're feeling and thinking, that sort of thing. Um, and just really preserving those for future generations. So uh, one of the things that we talk about with oral histories is pairing video oral history, so making these, these videos, uh, home videos, um, and pairing it with photo identification. Um, this is especially really timely for holiday seasons. You might have more family in your home. Um, and taking that time to pull out photo albums and have people identify who are in these photos and take those notes and take those records. Um, those are all really important things. Um, objects are another thing uh, that we really encourage people to do. So if you have, um, you know, a China collection, uh, this kind of is, is more of a personal story too. Uh, my mother collects lots and lots and lots of teacups and saucers, and it's something where her mother collected them and, you know, back and back and back. But I don't necessarily know, even as her daughter, which ones are the family heirlooms and which are the ones that she found on like Facebook Marketplace that just spoke to her because she liked the pattern. So taking that time, and we have done this, of taking that time and asking, hey, which ones are the ones that you inherited? What were those stories? What can you tell me about grandma? What can you tell me about you guys using this tea set? You know, what was that like? Um, taking video of that and recording it is just something that I'm sure I'll treasure for years and years and years to come. Um, and it adds value for me too, whenever I'm looking at these things of that's a tea set now that I want to keep, you know, that has meaning and value to me. And I have the story that I'll have recorded with my mother that goes hand in hand with that. Um, so that's just one of those ways where as you're recording family videos uh, and you're trying to think of, you know, what should I record? What's worthwhile? Things like that, photo identification, um, childhood stories, uh, asking those sorts of questions are all really important. Um, so family heirlooms, I mean, that's really important. Um, you know, photos, prize knickknacks, those are just really starting points for you to start having those conversations about why things are valued or important or what are the stories behind things. Um, from there, it's a really great uh, Kind of jumping off point of what questions might you ask um, and we'd say really questions that matter to you um, things that you're really curious about um, asking someone what's the best advice you've ever received and filming that response is an experience not only for the person narrating we call them narrators you know talking about the event but for you as someone who's listening and honoring that story you're sure to learn a lot more about the person you're speaking with um, I don't think we really sit down anymore and have conversations one-on-one -on -one without a lot of other things going on. Um, and so we've actually put together uh, quite a few different resources uh, to help you in recording oral histories uh, and kind of incorporating that into family videos you might be taking. Um, so we have um, a Stories Matter Taking Time to Listen sheet. Uh, that you can actually uh, pick up at the uh, Tongas Historical Museum, the Totem Heritage Center, and even the Ketchikan Public Library. Um, so taking a look at that, uh, let's do the front side of that, that's okay. Okay, I have it up. All right, so just taking a look at this, this is a rundown of some of those helpful tip, hits, tips. Um, having a quiet place is important. Um, away from distraction uh, might be <laughs> quite a challenge if you're, you're doing it around the holiday season, but it just makes it all the more uh, special for that. Um, actively listening and asking follow-up questions. Uh, this is really important. Even whenever you're, you're going to record a family video, um, maybe having an idea in mind of some of those things you're curious about, whether it's you're using a photo album to prompt questions um, or you're 
uh, you know, you have those objects that you want to learn more about. Why are they important? Why are they on display? That sort of thing. Um, one of the really important things, too, is people listening later on, they might not have that context. Um, they might not know who people are in photos or why they're at events. Um, so those are all really important things to expand upon, and you'll learn more, um, both through speaking and telling your story and through listening. Um, yes and no questions can be a challenge, uh, especially if you're talking with a rel relative who might be a little reticent, um, someone who you know wouldn't necessarily write down their story for you, so this is probably a good way to, to learn more is through these uh, um, interviews, you know, video interviews that you might conduct it within your family. Um, asking folks to recall those details, those are the ways that you can really space those out. Um, asking questions like, what did your kitchen smell like when you were growing up? You know, this is, it's definitely a conversation that you can have. Um, you can expand and learn more. And it, it doesn't have to be one-sided. Uh, learning and speaking together uh, on a family recording like this can be a very, very worthwhile event too. Um, we've already talked a little bit about photo identification. Um, for us at the museum, this is such an important thing too, especially when uh, collections of photos are donated to the museum. Uh, when we have people in those photos identified, events identified, it's just fantastic. It makes us able to better um, better really honor those donations um, by knowing who's in it and how we can actually showcase it or um, use it to tell really stories that, that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to tell. Um, and part of that too, and part of that drive is honoring the stories that are shared with you and, and just the way that we honor those stories that are shared with us. Um, we like to make certain that, um, you know, those unique voices are heard. Um, so whether you're recording a family history or you're part of our oral history program, um, which is something we have at the uh, Ketchikan Museums if you want to learn more about how to go about actually recording history either with your family uh, or if you want to be part of our project and really recording some of those unique voices and experiences from our community. Um, those are all things that kind of go hand in hand. Uh, thanking people and listening is really kind of the keys there. Um, so we have that information. Uh, is there a front side to that one? Yes. All right, let's pull that real quick. So yes, it's really just about inviting people. There we go. <laughs> inviting people to share that with you. Um, so again, anytime you're filming, uh, you know, you've got your camera out uh, or you're scheduling and making that deliberate time to record oral histories, uh, recording family histories and conversations. Um, it's really, it's important. Um, so you can go about that. I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's super easy. Uh, you All you need is a smartphone, uh, other device to record interviews. If this is something that you're passionate about, um, we do have uh, equipment that you can get trained on through Ketchikan Museums and check out and do those recordings. Um, it doesn't have to be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be someone that you just think is really interesting and you want to learn more. Um, you know, inviting and having those conversations is important. Um, so along with recording your interviews, uh, I know uh, Pat's talked a little bit about how she posted hers on uh, YouTube uh, and then it was like unlisted so family members could see and comment on and help with that identification. Um, I'd go a step further and really encourage people to Consider museums. Um, we have uh, a collection of videos from uh, Ketchikan surrounding areas. Um, it always is such an enriching thing, not just for uh, our narratives and our ability to actually um, collect and interpret history through those videos, uh, but it really also is uh, an important way for us to keep some of those records for history. So you might not think that the you know, baseball game that your kid was playing in is something that's, you know, museum worthy. Uh, but there's so much more that could be involved with that. Um, you know, it's especially in this time of, of uh, pandemic and COVID-19, being able to record some of these histories or, you know, even if it's just video on your phone um, of what people are experiencing, even in the day-to-day, -day, what grocery shopping is like, what those baseball games are like now as opposed to years past, 
um, recording some of those and having them in our archives is important. So I would encourage you too to consider um, if you were looking to donate um, your videos or do oral history recordings uh, for the museum, we have information about that. Um, it's super easy to get started. Uh, we have a website, you don't even, you can submit things online that way um, and at ketchikanmuseums.org. Um, but I think really the driving point is that technology has made this really accessible and easy to do. Um, and it's just a matter of taking the time to really sit down with family members, with friends, and have conversations that you record. Um, and really by doing that, you elevate what might be a simple family recording into something that museums might be able to use later on and that your generations and generations to come will get so much value out of because they'll understand more about not just the things that were important to you, uh, but really your experiences and history as you lived it. Um, so again, I just would encourage you to take the time to listen and take the time to have those meaningful conversations um, that goes hand in hand with oral histories. Uh, so I, th I think that kind of covers it. Uh, we definitely want to thank uh, UAS and the Asking UAS uh, segments for inviting us to participate. Um, and we would encourage you to keep on recording your videos. So may I ask you this, yes. the flyer that we've been going through, uh, yes. how, how can we go about finding that uh, on your sure. website? Sure, I'll ask, that one actually isn't on the web ah. website yet. <laughs> Uh, this one is uh, available in print, in person, at the Ketchikan Public Library uh, or at the Totem Heritage Center or Tongass Historical Museum. Um, and along with that, if you wanted to start young, uh, we also have um, kind of a tie into oral histories and a tie into those family conversations is actually a time capsule. Um, and this is geared more toward younger kids. So if you wanted to start with, uh, you know, recording some of this information with your, your children or um, you know, with family or friends, uh, it's a great jumping off point because it has some of those prompt cards with questions and things. Um, so that's, that's you know, an important kind of fun thing. Um, and it's definitely a way for you to record information about what 2020 was like for you or, or your family or, or uh, your friends. So any, any other questions that have come up? Uh, no, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yes, no, thank you for having us. And uh, again, thank you for recording your history. Uh, that's it's definitely a family commitment or an individual commitment of documenting what you experience. So thank you very much. Oh, actually, I do have a question yeah. um, that I think might be on people's minds is with the, uh, the proliferation of easy recording nowadays today uh, compared to 20 years ago, 100 years ago, what is the... What is really the societal value for preserving those for our community as opposed to just for our own personal family history? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, you know, I, I touched on it just a little bit of, you know, your everyday experience might not feel super phenomenal to you, but down the line, it can really help. Um, I'll use, you know, our, our COVID-19 collecting as an example there. Um, when we went into our archives and we started to look at what was this like um, during the Spanish flu or what were things like, you know, years and years past, um, how did Ketchikan respond to pandemic, right? We figured we might be able, you know, what, what do we have in the archives? And it really came down to just newspaper articles. We didn't have much in way of personal accounts or photographs. So I think that would kind of liken to how things are today. So we're actively um, collecting stories and resources about people's experiences with COVID-19 because while we can get a broad, you know, community-based or national history, um, understanding things on that personal level really is tied to the collection that we have. Um, so if we don't have, um, you know, photos or video of what it was like for people on the individual level, 50 years down the line when curators or folks are you know, putting together an exhibit about what my life might have been like here in Ketchikan, that's going to be missing information. Um, another really great example of that would be our latest uh, Into the Wind exhibit. So um, there's an exhibit right now at the museum, uh, also available online, called Into the Wind, and it's all about Southeast Alaska and aviation and the role it's played. Um, we made a call out and we had some uh, video in our collection, but we asked community members, hey, share your photo or your videos and photos of your you know, what was flight meant to you. So we got a lot of, um, you know, 
vacation video of people flying and uh, a lot of the pilots in the area sent us and shared with us some phenomenal videos. Uh, again, those are all you know up on the website. Um, but without our community taking that time to actually record that video and know it existed, they wouldn't be able to share it with us. And then we wouldn't be able to really add that value to the stories that we're interpreting and sharing and telling. Um, so yeah, it's really, really important. Um, even the humdrum, I, I think it's, <laughs> it's really important. Uh, the everyday things. You might not think that your story is phenomenal, um, but it really does add to the tapestry of kind of history here in Ketchikan and really adds value to that. All right. Thank you so much for coming in yes. today. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for attending our Facebook Live presentation of Home Movies, Preserving Family and Community History, a Ask UAS presentation presented by the University of Alaska Southeast Ketchikan Campus Library. For more information about our upcoming Ask UAS presentations or to be put on our email list, please be sure to call us at 228-4567. As always, you can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Ketchikan Campus Library.